Today's episode of the Oscar Real Movie Podcast is a bit longer than the ones we've done in the past. We had a we had a great time making it though. If my scheduling is correct, today is Thanksgiving, so happy Thanksgiving to listeners out there. Who knows, maybe someone out there listening is driving on their way to a family member's house and uh, you can turn on our podcast and we can keep you entertained for the next two plus hours. So today we uh, break down and review the new movie Parasite, which we're excited to talk about. A little Survivor TV talk. And we break down the 2007 Best Picture winner, No Country for Old Men. So we hope you enjoy the podcast and have a happy Thanksgiving. Lights, camera, action. Welcome to this week's Oscar Real Movie Podcast, where every week we review the past Best Picture winners and current movies with Oscar buzz. I'm your host, Haley Schmidt. And I'm Matthew Schmidt. And we've got another exciting schedule today. Uh, We also have a few trailers that we will get into here shortly, and then... Um, I'm going to test Matt's movie knowledge by giving him a quiz at the end. Yeah, yeah. So, I hope you studied up. There's nothing to study no, for. No, I didn't. I I'm didn't just going to see how impressive your movie knowledge is. Or, or how much you've been talking it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, should we get into this week's trailers? How, how are you been doing? I just, I just asked because uh, you've actually been running lately on the treadmill downstairs which has been making me feel like shit because i did a contest with some friends in october for running where i ran like three or four times a week and i i haven't used that app in so long that it's i looked at my phone and it's actually like offloaded (laughs) so yeah have you run at all during the month of november not really. Not no. really. <laughs> Cuz like, I'm doing it because we have a I have a Ragnar coming up in like May or something where some friends and I are going to be running 30 miles from Chicago each 30 miles each running from Chicago to Madison. So we're trying to be ready for it. And Haley Haley will be joining us for that, right? No, definitely not. Um, Unless you guys feel like uh, listening to the podcast as you run. (laughs) But no, I will be at the finish line uh, congratulating you like uh, like I did two years ago. You guys are crazy. Can't believe you're doing it again, but at least you're going to be better prepared this time. Hopefully. Yeah, as long as I have uh, more months like I did in October, I need to get off my my butt here but anyways jake if you're listening you're gonna drive for us so okay (laughs) okay cool uh let's start off with the first trailer for the week it's a film called richard jewel which is written or excuse me directed and produced by clint eastwood um we've got sam rockwell olivia wilde Kathy Bates, John Hamm starring in this one, and it is about the 1996 bombing during the Atlanta Olympics, which honestly, I don't know much about. I'm surprised because you love the Olympics. Yeah, but... I know it was 96 <laughs> and we were six years old, so like we weren't watching it. Or if we were watching it, we don't remember it at all. I was saying, but, I, I, but you I, I love very, the Olympics. Yes, so. I very clearly remember uh, Carrie Strug's pole, uh, pole vault. My goodness, Carrie Strug's vault uh, for gymnastics. But uh, the bombing is not something that I ever remember yeah. coming across. And even um, like the, the name Richard Jewell is not uh, a name that I'm familiar with. But I'll say like watching the trailer, like instantly, I was like, okay, this guy's face looks familiar. Like I know, obviously, it's not. They're not showing pictures of the real Richard Jewell, but just seeing it had, you know, kind of a familiar look to it, I guess. Yeah, well, I mean, that the actor is going to look like him mm-hmm. a little bit, at least. But yeah, it was interesting that, you, you know, you'd said that because his name is one of the few things I do know or remember about this. Obviously, I remember that or know that there was a bombing. Richard Jewell was the guy who found the bomb. 
but became the prime suspect as like the bomber. Uh, I think they say it in the trailer at one point, you know, it's kind of when there's any kind of murder investigation or assault investigation, you know, it's usually the spouse or someone who knows the person closely as the prime suspect. So in the trailer, they kind of state the person who finds the bomb is usually the prime suspect. Mm, uh, okay. But I, I'm, I'm excited for this. Clint Eastwood, uh, he's won two Academy Awards for directing. Uh, that's for Unforgiven in 92 and The Million Dollar Baby in 2004. So he's a very accomplished director especially like every uh, a lot of people know him for his acting obviously in the westerns but uh, his award prestige has really come up in directing and he's had some amazing films but i feel like he hasn't really had an award-worthy movie in a while maybe he, since like gran torino was kind of the last one i think of it had like a lot of a lot of buzz a lot of intrigue around it and correct me if I'm wrong, but that's kind of the last one that, you know, I think of. Like, oh, yeah, that was a great Clint Eastwood movie. Yeah, let me just bring up his filmography here. Yeah, as a director, so Gran Torino was back in 2008, and that movie did get a lot of great reviews. Uh, award-wise, he didn't really get anything for it. Invictus was his next movie after that, which... That was big. Yeah, that one I would say got more award. Like Matt Damon and Morgan Freeman got nominated for Oscars that year. That might have been the only Academy Awards that that movie got nominated for. But that was a great movie. That's probably looking at this. You know, he had American Sniper in tw- two thousand fourteen. But oh gosh, yeah. But I know, <laughs> I know you don't you don't like that movie. I didn't love it. Uh, I thought Bradley Cooper. Cooper Bradley Cooper, rightfully so, got a Best Actor nomination for it, but that's really the only thing I liked about that movie. I didn't love that movie. Yeah, I think it was a little overrated. So yeah, since Gran Torino, it's the Invictus, Hereafter, which is, I never saw it, but it's not a good movie with Matt Damon. J. Edgar, which had Leo in it, so yeah. that didn't quite live up to the hype. Jersey Boys, American Sniper, Sully, The 1517 to Paris, the Mule and now Richard Jewell. So, fifteen seventeen in Paris, no one saw, no one liked. Some people liked The Mule, but I think that's kind of overall considered a boring movie. So I just he hasn't had an award worthy movie in a long time. But I think this could be it. This is this looks great. It's got great uh, cast to it. Who who is in this movie? I saw Sam Rockwell in there. I think he plays as Richard Jewell's lawyer. Mm-hmm. Yep, we've also got Olivia Wilde, Kathy Bates, and John Hamm are kind of the big big name uh, actors in this one. Yeah, love John Hamm. So, and I think this is a movie that it's an it's about an event that a lot of people know about the bombing in '96 Olympics, but it isn't anything super famous. I mean, we can, other than knowing about the bombing, like you and I can't really give too many details about it. So it's a movie I think. That he can kind of dig into and kind of, you know, make a movie about a subject that not a ton of people know about. Yeah. So I think it could be really interesting. I agree. And I feel like that's a common theme that I've seen over the last couple of years. Like, you know, we've seen stuff, more and more stuff like the O.J. Simpson trial and um, like the Central Park jogger case and stuff like that. I feel like things that kind of happen around that time are kind of coming back the, around yeah. into media again. Yeah. The Central Park Five Netflix like docudrama that we watched recently, which was fantastic. It's called When They See Us. Yeah, that that was fantastic, and that is I think kind of goes in line with the Richard Jewell thing, where it's something a lot of people probably know about, but they don't know a lot of details about it. So kind of diving into it more is uh, good. The OJ thing is I, I think that's a different animal. That's something everyone knows about. Everyone knows almost everything. <laughs> about that. Right. It's just kind of the the time period that I'm thinking. I, f- I feel like there's like a the lot of things. nostalgic things, things coming there, around? Yeah, there's there? there's a lot of things from like the early 90s that seem to be coming back into um, Yeah, that's good. People, people like us who are kids back then or barely born are now adults and the nostalgic things coming around, but yeah. yeah. So yeah, this one comes out uh, December 13th, so just a few weeks from now. Probably be something I think I'll put on my list to go see yeah, this winter I for sure. I, I don't probably don't depend on what else comes out around that time. I, I don't know if I need to see it right away, but 
if it if it falls in line with it, yeah, I think this is definitely a movie I want to see. Yeah. So the next movie or trailer we have is called Uncut Gems. It stars Adam Sandler. Uh, another actress you might know is Adina Menzel. And this is probably the first like major dramatic role that I think I've seen Adam Sandler in. I'll say uh, when we saw a movie the other night, this trailer was there in the theater. And the first thing you see is Adam Sandler as this kind of like high stakes New York City jeweler and everyone because like he's got kind of a different look and like it looks like he's had something with like his teeth, whatever, like, you know, it, you can tell it's Adam Sandler, but he's had some stuff done. And I think there were a number of people in the theaters kind of went, whoa, what? Like, it was very unexpected. Yeah, I, I want to, this movie, I'm very excited for this movie. Uh, I, I hadn't really heard of it until... Yeah, I heard nothing about this. Yeah, I, I didn't hear of it until maybe a month ago. Like, when the trailer first hit, which this isn't a brand new trailer, this has been out for a little while, but like you said, we went and saw uh, a movie that we'll be reviewing soon. Uh, we went and saw a movie last night, and this was a trailer for, and it, it reminded me that we should talk about this trailer, because, like, like you mentioned, Adam Sandler's in this, but you, you, you mentioned you can't think of a lot of dramatic roles for him. Yeah, he's obviously known for comedy. He's done some dramatic stuff, like Punch Drunk Love which he's great in, or Rain Over Me with Don Cheadle. They're, he's good. Like The thing about Adam Sandler, I think he's a good actor, but he just does all these buddy co like comedies with his buddies where they just go out to Hawaii for a couple months, make a bunch of money, and have fun doing it, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. I just... I like. I want to see more roles like this from Adam Sandler. Yeah, it's I think exciting. He's good. Exciting when you see him in something a little bit different. Yeah. So this, like you mentioned, he plays like a jeweler. At first, I thought maybe this was based on a true story. I don't think it is, which I think you know. I don't think it really affects like how good the movie is. But he plays a jeweler. It seems like from the trailer, he's just collecting money from a bunch of different loan sharks or something, and then betting it instantly. Kevin Garnett is in this trailer a lot like it must yeah. take place in in boston or new york it, some i think it's new york but you know they're they're i guess close enough to each other where kevin garnett is in it a lot yeah and uh yeah he seems to be just betting a lot of the money that he's getting from these loan sharks and possibly losing a lot of it so he's in trouble throughout most of the trailer but this premiered i don't know exactly when or where but all i know is that adam sandler is getting a lot of like acclaim for his acting in this movie mm -hmm. and he might be getting his first oscar nomination for it that would be really cool i i hope he does i mean with you know towards the end of the year when we get closer to award season uh we'll we'll take a look at the movies we've seen and maybe come up with a list of like who we think should get nominated yeah. but i hope that he is at the top of that list because like I said, he's a good actor that's just been around for a while. He just doesn't always show his dramatic chops. But apparently he does in this movie, and I'm really excited to see it. Uncut Gems is coming out uh, Christmas Day. Uh, the next movie we have is the SpongeBob movie, Sponge on the Run. And this story focuses on uh, SpongeBob's pet squirrel. 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 I keep saying that. <laughs> Uh, He's a snail. Oh my god. Uh, Spongebob's pet snail named Gary. Uh, Spongebob comes home and Gary's missing. So he and Patrick can go on this adventure to not the lost city of Atlantis, but the lost city of Atlantic City. So it's like this Atlantic City underwater. Um, I don't know. It looks stupid. It looks funny. I was a huge Spongebob fan growing up, so there were... <laughs> the trailer got a lot of laughs out of me. So, like I said, it's just some of that humor is just so stupid and so funny. So, it's not a movie I need to see, but uh, the trailer made me laugh. So, I yeah, think that's how, worth it. <laughs> how popular or relevant is SpongeBob still? Like, I, I feel like it's a show that's been running for a long time. Yeah, like, it's is it still, still on. Is it still on? It's still on, and they're still okay. doing new episodes. Um, but I honestly I have no idea how popular it actually is with, with kids these days. Okay, because, yeah, I'm just wondering who this movie appeals to. Because, like, people like us, where we were kids when Spongebob was, was like, 
at, you know, in the early beginnings, it's mm-hmm. very popular. Like, mm-hmm. are we the ones who are supposed to go wanting to see this, or is it kids these days? Keanu Reeves is in this trailer, so I feel like they're kind of pulling on, like, the Ke- keanu sans that's going on right now, where he's, you know, with the John Wick movies and everything going on, uh, he's just super popular, kind of like how he was in, what was that Netflix movie with... Um, uh, um, always be my maybe. Yeah, that would with a- yeah, Ali Wong and uh, Randall Park. Yeah, Randall Park. Yeah, he's got a scene in there where he plays himself. You know, because like he's just so popular now that he gets these roles where he basically plays himself or has little cameos to have a draw. But yeah, I mean, it, the animation looks cool. It's a little different in SpongeBob than w- when the TV show was on for us at least. So yeah, it's like the more like the three dimensional like yeah. Pixar style animation instead of like the two D cartoon like the TV show is. Yeah, so it it, it looks like SpongeBob. It, you know, they they've got those you know kind of lame put jokes in there but like how they're underwater but i think in the trailer at one point spongebob slips on a puddle and then absorbs water and shoots it it's like but you uh, live underwater i'll that never thing. i'll never understand so, that i mean that's that's spongebob they have stuff like that all the time so uh one thing in this trailer that possibly some listeners here might appreciate is at one point patrick and spongebob go to a casino because like you said they're going to atlantic city Mm -hmm. and they're betting on a roulette (laughs) and they say what does patrick say he goes bet on he says i'm putting all my money on 11 or on l L. i'm putting my money on l i'm putting all my money on l and spongebob's like what are you talking about and what do they show they show red seven so patrick is betting on red seven in roulette in the trailer for those, I don't mean to do an inside joke on a podcast, but for those <laughs> listening who understand what that means, that means we got to hit the casino soon and bet on some Red 7. Uh, SpongeBob Sponge on the Run will be out May in 2020. Our last trailer for the day is Sonic the Hedgehog, which will be coming out in February. This one has Jim Carrey and James Marsden seem to be the kind of main characters for the people in this one and ben schwartz voices sonic you might not necessarily recognize his name but he does a lot of um, acting and writing but you'll probably most recognize him as playing jean ralphio from parks and rec uh which is funny because the first time i saw his trailer i'm like god why is the sonic voice like so annoying and then i found out it was the guy that does jean ralphio i'm like oh yep okay that makes sense (laughs) Yeah, so this movie and trailer, yeah, I love John Ralphio, was under huge scrutiny. I'm sure you remember when the first trailer aired months and months ago, Sonic looked different than what he did in this trailer. And instantly people hated it. They said, you need to redesign him. Admittedly, like, I played Sonic as a kid. The Sonic in that first trailer didn't. Other than being it, blue, it did. It <laughs> didn't look. I mean, I was not a big Sonic fan, or like I never played the video game or anything. But instantly, I just thought, well, that's not what Sonic the Hedgehog looks like. Yeah, I, I kind of get what they were going for. They wanted it to be like, like, I mean, Sonic is a video game character, so it's like if he was real life, this is what he would look like. You know, they were trying to make it more realistic. Okay, but he's just. He's a, fr- he's a video game character. Like, who cares? Just make him look like he does in the video game. That's what people want to see. Yeah, he doesn't need to look realistic. No, like, it's just make him look like the video game. And that's what they did. They went back, like, it, almost instantly the director came back and said, okay, we'll redesign it. We, you know, we'll, we'll make this, we'll make this happen. We'll make it work. And so million, I don't know how much, but millions, millions of dollars later, Months and months later, and now I'm sure the movie's been pushed back. Uh, they come out of this new trailer. People universally seem to be happy about it with the look of him. And it, he looks exactly like he should have originally. I don't know yeah. why we just didn't get this in the first place. Like, who in the, who in the room of, like, designing Sonic, like, thought that was a good idea? Like, no one stood up and said, shouldn't we just make him look like the video game? Like, it baffles me how decisions get made sometimes. It's, yeah, I feel like that's a common trend where you see things come out, not and not even necessarily in movies, but sometimes things come out and 
instantly people have a reaction to it and you're like wow how did no one think of this yeah. before it hit millions of people but yeah anyway so the movie the redesign looks great the movie you know is being when's it coming out uh february in february so jim carrey looks good i mean he doesn't do too much acting anymore i think he's in t like a tv show or he does some stuff every once in a while but he isn't in as much stuff as he used to so it's i like seeing jim carrey it's like he's got his usual Jim Carrey humor in this, so I'm sure yeah. he'll be funny. Very, yeah, very like physical, comedic role yeah. for him. Like he always really gets like into that over the top yes. kind of stuff. Yeah, so you, I'm sure he'll be funny. Uh, Sonic like seems like he'll be fine. Ben Ben Schwartz. Yep. Uh, seems funny. I could. They seem to be kind of taking the angle of kind of the Flash because, which is funny because he is reading. A Flash comic in the trailer. Oh, I didn't even notice that. Yeah, but, and I say that because Flash in more recent comics, you know, obviously his superpower is he's super fast, but everything about him is super fast. Uh, he, he has to eat a lot because his metabolism is fast. He thinks fast. He talks fast. Like, that's what the Flash is in comics these days. And that's what Sonic seems to be like. He, he talks really fast. He, you know, it's short attention span like they're driving down the highway and he goes oh i need to go see the biggest rubber band ball in north america and before james marsden can even say no we're not going to go he's out the door and back already like he's kind of all over the place which is kind of similar to the flash which is kind of cool uh, other than that though i don't think this movie is going to be that good sonic was a fun game for us as a kid but when you really think about it there wasn't a lot of plot in the original game at least it was just Go run this track as fast as you can. So story-wise, we'll see what they come up with. But video game movies don't traditionally do too well. I think Pikachu, Detective Pikachu, is like the most critically acclaimed video game movie <laughs> that's come out. Mm -hmm. And while it was good, it wasn't a great movie. So, you know, hopefully it's good, but I, I don't expect it to be anything fantastic. Yeah. I'm not sure. For me, I don't think it would be worth the watch. Yeah, it'd be unless it comes out of nowhere with great reviews, in which case I would want to go see it because I, I played the video game as a yeah. kid. Might but be worth something watching at home. Or that's something, yeah. Maybe. Short short of it getting surprisingly good reviews, it's nothing that I would probably need to see right away. Okay. Any other <clears throat> news before we get into our uh, movie reviews for the week? Uh, you know, a couple things that I kind of wanted to bring up and see if you had heard of this or get your opinion on it. So, did you hear about the James Dean movie that's going to be coming out? No. When I say James Dean movie, what do you think I mean by that? I have no idea. Okay. I always get, like, James Dean, Steve McQueen, I always get those people confused and I feel stupid for saying that but that's why i say i don't know because okay. i'm not sure i'm thinking of the right person James Dean, he was the like rebel without a cause guy he he died very very young mm -hmm. uh so i can't remember what studio it was but they're coming out with a war movie it's gonna star St uh james dean oh with the like not i guess not hologram but like they're going to like digitally like yeah put him in okay i did hear about that only from the standpoint that i saw a lot of actors like i think chris evans was someone who was pretty vocal like this is stupid why are we doing this okay i didn't know i didn't know chris evans came out and said anything but i agree with him so apparently james dean family like backed this they said it's okay to do hmm. okay but the studio said that they're doing this because they couldn't find any other actor who could play the role oh good lord Okay, no. And it's like, that's just stupid. No, of course you could find someone. Like, James Dean was great. I've seen a lot of his movies just because, I mean, he's kind of become an icon for multiple reasons. Unfortunately, one of them might have been because of his his uh, death at a younger age. But he did receive two Oscar nominations, both of them after his death, which is interesting. But to say that... He's the only person that could play this role just seems ridiculous to me. Like this ha this has to be just a ploy, right? Like in like cuz it, it the movie's not going to be like this is the life of James Dean. Like they're literally trying to use him as like an actor in place of a real life person. That is so ridiculous. 
What's yeah. the What's the movie gonna be? It's, I'm, Paul, I'm do looking, we know? I'm looking. I, I'm looking right now. I'm looking at James Dean's IMDb page right now to see if he has a future film. <laughs> so I don't know. It's a Vietnam War movie. Finding Jack, I think, is what it's called. But while trying to look this up, I found another story that says. Apparently, the producers of this film tried doing the same thing, but with Elvis Presley first, but Elvis Presley's family turned him down. This is, like, the most bizarre story. That just, like, I mean, that just confirms that, like, this is some kind of, I, I don't know like what word I'm... ploy yeah, tactic like, or something, like a marketing tactic. Yeah, because tactic. if they tried doing Elvis first, like, I feel like they're not even trying to find a real-life actor to do it. No. I don't know. I heard about this and just wanted to talk about it, see if you had heard of it and get your reaction about it's it. It's so strange. Yeah, it's, I, we'll see how that turns out. Last thing I thought about bringing up was, uh, how are you feeling about Survivor lately? Oh my gosh. Okay, so I have seen every single season of Survivor with the exception of one. And I got you into this show a couple of years ago. I guess it's probably more than a couple now. But it is like my all-time favorite show. It's that show that's always been there. It's like the perfect competition show. It's the perfect reality show. And I love it. I look forward to it every single Wednesday. And last week's episode was a like a two-hour episode where the two tribes merge. And usually that's always a very exciting episode or a lot of really interesting things can happen because it's when like the two tribes merge and come together and it's an individual game. So like there's a lot of strategy, a lot of crazy stuff going on. Well, some of that's kind of been teased the whole season because it happened in the very first episode is there's this guy, Dan, who... Oddly enough, like he's a talent executive like in LA in Hollywood and he works for and represents you know, some of the people we talk about on this podcast and he I, I don't even want to say he's a touchy feely person because that right off the bat kind of gives him ex- an excuse. But he um you know had been touching one of the younger women on the show and right away she said, "Hey, um she kind of used it as an excuse saying, like, I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a germaphobe, so don't touch me like that. Like, don't rub my back and don't, like, touch my head when we're in the sh- in the shelter and all this stuff. And he's like, oh, okay, like, I didn't mean by anything by it. Like, I'll stop. And you don't really see <clears throat> much from them um, until the merge. Part of that is because they swap tribes and they're on different places. But people have always kind of said, like, oh, yeah, Dan's always a person, like, going through people's stuff, and he's always really close to this person, and he'll put your arms around you, like, in the middle of the night, and seemingly innocuous stuff, but when they're back together at the merge, this girl, I mean, she breaks down crying on the show, and she's just like, I don't like how he touches me, and he makes me super uncomfortable, and blah, blah, blah. Long story short, she says, you know what? I can put that aside for my game, uh, because Dan is part of my strategy, And producers give everyone on the cast, like, they have a conversation about it. And Dan is given a formal warning saying, like, you need to respect people's boundaries, blah, blah, blah. But he is partially in denial about it, partially doesn't understand the severity of what's going on. And then you also have other women on the show who, in their confessionals, have said, I don't like it when Dan touches me either. But they weren't as uncomfortable with it and they actually chose to use it as a strategy and say, Dan, there's nothing wrong with what you've done and we need to keep you around. And the girl who made this f- formal kind of complaint with her producers and said, this makes me really uncomfortable, she ends up getting voted out and Dan's still around because um, like other people used his inappropriateness as a strategy and that totally crossed the line for me and it's it's hard because the people in the show have all said they're able to separate personal things with gameplay and I'll never understand what that's like because I'll never be on Survivor but it's it made the show so uncomfortable to watch that week 
And the whole week going into it, everyone was kind of thinking, you know, how is CBS going to deal with this? Because honestly, last week, I think they were kind of patting themselves on the back like, hey, we did a really good job. We actually, you know, we asked Kelly if she wanted us to do something or say something more. And she took it upon herself, which she did not need to do. But she took it upon herself to say, no, that's okay. I can separate my personal feelings with the game. And, you know, the show never provided, hey, here are resources for, you know, if you've been victims of sexual assault or domestic violence or, you know, any sort of other resources for people to go. And honestly, coming into this week, I thought, I'm like, this is so gross, so nasty. I was half surprised they didn't get rid of Dan just on the spot. But at the same time, I don't think the producers really knew what to do. And so they probably did the best with what they had. And but I thought, like, oh, moving forward, like, I feel like they're going to kind of cut Dan out of the edit. And honestly, I think he had more screen time this week than any other episode before this. And it was so uncomfortable. And it just makes me feel really gross. It makes me feel really creepy. Um, the two people who were voted out, well, actually going back to last week, the two people who got voted out last week, they usually they're given exit press the day after the episode episode airs and they weren't allowed exit press until Monday. So like four days later, four or five days later. And same thing with the, with this week's episode, we had two more people go home and one of them has declined all requests for exit interviews and the other one has made themselves unavailable for exit interviews. So it's just, it's super weird as to how this is all playing out and it's makes it really sad because it's a show that I really love and but at the same time, I all the people who stood up for Kelly in the situation, there's one person left in the game. And the thing that's really tough is as much as I love her, her one of her number one allies is Dan. And that's just really, really tough. So it sucks and it makes me sad. And I know that a lot of people in the survivor community are kind of hurting over it. And I don't, I honestly don't know if I'll watch the rest of the season, but I'm glad that it's an opportunity for people to talk about this stuff and for the show to get their act together the next time. I, I don't want to say the next time, but if something like this ever happens again, that they have a protocol because they have very strict protocol for medical situations. If anyone's ever physically violent, they have defined protocol and they have used that in both situations said you, you're done out of this game. Um, it amazes me that in across 20 years and 39 seasons, they don't have protocol for inappropriate behavior. So yeah, that's down the survivor rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, I think I might cut out the part where you go long story short, because I think you talk for like 20 <laughs> minutes after it. It's it's a, it's a heavy topic. No, I know, I know. And I know you have strong beliefs about it, which is why I wanted to bring it up, because yeah, I think watching it, like, in game, they probably didn't realize that this was as big of a deal as it. They had is no idea because they haven't done anything. No idea. They haven't brought it up or or anything. There was the the night of the first tribal when it happened. Jeff Probst, who hosts the show, had a couple nice moments where Dan was like, "So we're not going to let this go. We're not going to let this go." And he kept saying that. And Jeff finally came and good. No, we're not going to let this go. And you talk about it. And that moment was like, oh, "Okay, good job, Jeff." But then they haven't really brought it up since. Uh, I think they're realizing it now because I'm seeing articles all over the place where it's like Survivor is being irresponsible and things of that nature. So it'll be they always do a live reunion episode at the end of the season. So I don't know if I'll want to watch it, but it's going to be so ugly. Yeah. Yep. Makes me not want to watch it anymore either. Just an FYI. Yep, <laughs> I'm in I the just, same boat. I just don't care anymore. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but spoiler alert: season forty is supposed to be all winners, which I am very, very, very excited for. So, um, wake me up in February, I guess. Yeah. Last last couple things. 
Uh, within a span of two hours, uh, it was confirmed that they were making a Joker 2 movie. And then, and then they're not. Like, it was once reported that it was confirmed. Todd Phillips coming back, Joaquin coming back, making Joker 2. And then like two hours later, it was like, oh no, just kidding, not happening. So I know neither of us like loved that movie. I thought it was still a good slash great movie, but it doesn't need a sequel. I hope it no. doesn't happen. No. Last thing, I've been watching The Mandalorian, and it's... We've been watching The Mandalorian. We, correct. Sorry. You, I would say you've been watching all the like extra breakdowns and yeah. extra content around it. But yeah, we've watched the first two episodes together. What, what do you think? I want to get your opinion before I talk about... I mean, you kind of know mine already a little bit, but what do you think? You're not... A, you, you like Star Wars, but you're not a Star Wars nut. Yeah, I'm not... Yeah, totally obsessed with Star Wars. But no, I, I think it's really good. I guess I don't know what else to say besides I think it's... it's I mean, it's only been two episodes, but I think it's it's the right mix of kind of that adventure that you get from the original trilogy, uh, but you get the... Yeah, just like the strange creatures and I don't know. It's, it's cool to focus on something other than like the Jedi storyline. Yeah, and I think that's what I like about it is it's not... Like, the Skywalker storyline, which, you know, we'll get another movie in a month or so, but the Star Wars universe is so huge. Like, let's explore some of that other stuff, which is what I like about this. A character we don't know, but, like, we have a connection to in a way because it's the same species and occupation as Boba Fett. So there's some lore to it, but it's just, it's a, a scaled-down adventure, so it's a lot more practical effects, but... You know, some, uh, you know, hints to the original trilogy here or there, uh, here and there. So I, I love it. Yeah, I just love that it's kind of a scaled down adventure. So it feels a little more like the original trilogy. So I love it. Yeah. And of course, a lot of people really enjoy the... Spoiler alert. The Baby Yo. If you haven't seen yeah. The Baby Yo... Um, Honestly, I'll be very surprised. But it's like the we think maybe it's the same species that Yoda is, yeah, that, kind of. Yeah, that's so that's but it's super cute. It's just <laughs> a super cute little creature. Like it's, I mean, just picture like a baby Yoda. It looks so cute. It's like part gremlin, like part corgi with the ears, and he's got you know this little like. Does it remind you of Toby? Up. I know it reminds yeah. me of our dog. So it's super cute. Yeah, and that's like dig it a little bit Yoda like doesn't have a specific species like he was like the only one of his species i mean some of that is inaccurate because in the prequel trilogy there was like a yaddle who is who looked exactly like yoda and was on the jedi council but i don't know if that's just an error that they made in the movie or they decided to retcon that or change it but as of now yoda is like the only of his kind and this is a baby, even though he's really 50 years old, but they say he ages differently. So he might be 50 years old, but biologically he's a baby. Um, so yeah, a lot of mystery around that. Uh, there's debates on whether it's a clone of Yoda or yeah, just another species of Yoda, but really interesting. So if you're a Star Wars fan, or even if you're not, because I think people who don't watch Star have seen the Star Wars movies, I think you could still watch this and really enjoy it. Yeah, I think so too. Okay, I have been waiting for the day that we reviewed this movie because it's such a unique, original, fascinating, emotional response movie. So I'm so excited that today we are reviewing the movie Parasite. The one thing that makes me sad about this is that it's in such limited release in theaters that I think it'll be hard for people to see this. Yeah, it, it, it even took a little while for us together like we live in the madison area and we kind of got lucky this so this movie this was i think we'd mentioned it in an earlier podcast we'd seen movie like back-to-back -back movies in the same night it was this and our, the movie that we reviewed last week jojo rabbit which are both limited releases and they were both playing the same night in the same theater and we're like okay let's just go see both of them yeah so a little bit about this movie, um, I guess I would describe it probably as like a dramatic thriller. It comes from South Korea, so the movie is entirely in subtitles, uh, which honestly I didn't, sometimes I can have a problem with that, but I it did not phase me one bit that this whole movie was in subtitles. Yeah, yeah I don't mind that. 
at all. I can, you know, kind of see how that would bug some people. I mean, one of my favorite. Sometimes I just get all distracted. I mean, that's you you got to read it and you're trying to. Yeah, I get it. One of my favorite movies of all time is entirely in subtitles. So I get, I don't know. I'm just used. It doesn't bother me that much, but I get your point. Yeah. So this movie was co-written and directed by Bong Joon-ho. Uh, You might possibly know him from some of his previous movies like Snowpiercer or The Host or um, Okja. So Snowpiercer came out in 2013. Um, It's got Chris Evans and Tilda Swinton. And it takes place on this train in a post-apocalyptic society. Um, And the train cars kind of evolve into like this class system where it's like the rich social people are at like the front of the train the poor people are at the back of the train and basically like it takes a train like a full year to like circle the earth right so yeah it's it's something kind of like like that that. yeah but yeah it's kind of a message on like social classes and stuff hint hint for some of his other movies too yes and um and then okja is a story about a young girl who befriends a wild creature which is called the okja and she tries to prevent a corporation from destroying the habitat that one i think was a netflix original um snowpiercer is on netflix for the longest time too i don't know if it still is but but yeah both are good movies so you can check those out similarly kind of like you mentioned parasite also focuses on societal issues as well mm-hmm so uh, the main stars in this movie, like I said, you might not be too familiar with one, many of the actors because they predominantly do movies in South Korea or Southeast Asia. But the characters that play the uh, the dad and the son in this movie, uh, the dad has been both in The Host and Snowpiercer, and then the son is in Okja as well. Yeah, the guy that plays his dad is in, or that plays the dad in parasite is in almost maybe you looked it up beforehand so you can be more de- definitive about it but i remember like he's in almost all of this director's movies yeah yep um like, yeah, they're the... really they're really close and they're friends so so parasite focuses on the kim family um it's a husband and wife and their two 20 something uh year old kids none of whom uh, apparently have a full-time job they work odd end jobs, um, like you see them like pre-folding like pizza boxes or like meal boxes uh, to help support the rent. Um, they have kind of like this sub basement apartment. Um, so yeah, they're kind of struggling down on their luck when uh, until the son, his name is Kiwu. I'm gonna we're gonna try our best to refer to the characters as their character names. Uh, so so the son, uh, Kiwu, he meets up with a friend of his who asks if he'll take a job, uh, kind of replacing him as an English tutor for this daughter and this wealthy family, which is which is the Park family. Slowly, the entire Kim family kind of becomes entangled with the Park family, and. And the plot really focuses on the difference between this poor family and the wealthier family and kind of how people, like what people will do for their families. It's a good way to put it. Like you said, none of them are working. There was that cool scene early on where it's like an app or something where they just take on these giant, like just manual labor jobs. So they fold a hundred or 200 pizza boxes together but they do it really quickly and not that well, so the pizza people aren't too happy with it. And you kind of get an early sense that the, the kids, the son and the daughter, are really good. They're they're charismatic. They have good people skills because they kind of talk uh, the pe- pizza people like out of being too pissed and they get the money for doing it. Mm-hmm. You also get a sense on how poor they are because their apartment is kind of below ground. Like their windows are right at ground level and then the majority of the the living area is below ground Mm -hmm. and there's a a fumigation going on and they're like close the windows like no never mind free fumigations like keep the windows open so they just sit in like this area and you just kind of get a sense for how you know poor this family really is which is you know kind of heartbreaking in a sense yeah i mean even like the first scene of the movie shows um i think it's I think it's the son. I think it's Kiwu. He's walking around the apartment like his phone trying to pick up a Wi-Fi signal. And he's upset because the neighbor that they've been 
leeching the Wi-Fi off of, oh, now it's got a password. Yeah. And so you can see it there. They're always kind of trying to cut corners and make ends meet. Yep. And without getting, you know, before we get into spoilers, before we get too into it, I'll, this movie was fantastic. I had no idea what I would be, what we were going to be walking into. Even if you see the trailer for this, you don't really get a sense on what's going to happen. It takes so many twists and turns you think it's one thing, it turns out to be another. It's just absolutely insane. Uh, he does a great job, and I feel like he does this in most of his movies, of kind of mixing genres. Like You, you said you kind of consider it like a thriller. I mean, there's comedy in here. Uh, there's social issues in it with uh, different classes with this poor family and rich family, which we'll get into later. But, yeah, it just felt like a bunch of different movies... Uh, in one with all the different genres that are going on. Uh, something to note about it, it won the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Con Film Festival this year. Which is like the top award, right? Yeah, which is the, yeah, the top award for it. Uh, a movie we re reviewed earlier this year was up for it as well in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. But yeah, uh, the Cannes Film Festival is a huge festival and it won. He was the first Korean director to win the award. So yeah, this movie is just phenomenal. Rotten Tomatoes score, it's at a 99%. So Wow, okay. I mean, I, I guess I don't know why I'm surprised. I, I think probably just because like it's a little bit under the radar. I guess that doesn't mean that people can't like it, but I'm surprised that it's getting, like the reviews that it's getting reflect how I feel about it. Yeah, and like with the critics, like critics have more access to it. They'll see it at festivals, stuff like that. That's why this is a movie that like audience, you need to see. Like we're going to do a non-spoiler section of this, but if you want to see this movie... Do not listen to the spoiler. Yeah, like, I hate to say don't listen to our podcast, but don't listen. Go Skip see it. Skip ahead. Like, people, yep. people need to see this movie because while it's breaking records for like foreign films in the United States, it still isn't getting quite the release it probably should be getting so yeah people need to go see this movie mm -hmm. uh some of the oscars that i think it should get nominated for or possibly win it it will or should win fo foreign film a hundred percent this movie needs to be nominated for best picture which yes. automatically means that it's gonna win best foreign film you'd think this movie needs to be nominated for best picture uh bong joon ho should get nominated for best director. Writing, it should get nominated for just the so this twist. Is original screenplay, right? Or is it based on something? I don't think it's based on anything. I don't think so either. Yeah, I think it. It. I think it's original. I'm not seeing anything that it's based on it previous work. So I think it's original screenplay. It needs to be nominated for that because this movie, as we mentioned, takes so many twists and turns. It's absolutely insane, but they work too. Like a lot of movies can have too many turns that just don't make sense, but these, they seem ridiculous, but they work. Uh, and I think a lot of technical stuff it should get nominated for too. Uh, I think this is something you might have mentioned to me, but production design, that most of this movie takes place in a single house and they built it from scratch. Yeah. Which, like, blew my mind because it's... So, yeah, mo most of the film takes place in um, in the Park family's house. That's, so like, the wealthy family. And it's, you know, had been designed by this, you know, world-renowned architect. And so it's, like, this beautiful, stunning home. And, yeah, looking at the trivia about this movie on IMDb, I, yeah, had read that the, um, the, the house had been built as a set from scratch, which yeah. blew my mind. So production design... Film editing, too. Good film editing makes movies like this work really well, too. So I, just, I think that it needs to be up for that. As far as acting goes, they were all great. I just don't know if one stood out to me than, than any of the uh, others. So acting Oscars, I'm not too sure about. If any of them get nominated, I'll be happy for it. I just can't really pick any one of them out. But those other things it needs to get nominated for. And it better win Best Foreign Film. Yeah. 
So you mentioned that there's a lot that happens in this movie. So kind of along those lines, the movie is a little long. It's a little over two hours, which usually for me, that's that's too much. But I thought the movie was so well paced and it was really thoughtfully planned out. So I was never checking to see like what time it is or how how far into the movie are, are we. Uh, there were even like two separate occasions where I thought that the movie ended, uh, but there was another scene following it. So it didn't necessarily feel long-winded or anything, but I think I was maybe a little surprised that there was more to come, even though like I thought the movie was coming to an yeah, end. Yeah, it was paced very well, and that's where like, there's so many twists and turns. You think it's one thing, and then like halfway through the movie, something happens, and it's just, oh my goodness, what's, hap- what's going on right now? Mm-hmm. So yeah, pacing, everything, I never thought... I never went to look at my watch or anything during this. I mean, it held my attention the entire time. Yeah. Um, as far as scores go, I give this movie a solid 8.9 out of 10. I think it had a good mix of emotion and, like you said, the like there's some comedy to it. There's some drama. There's some thrilling moments. Um, it always kept me guessing and kind of surprised as well. I don't really feel like there were any scenes that felt like out of place or that weren't needed so I think it was like a really original idea which was cool I'm curious to see how the movie would play like watching it a second time around because I think the first you know there's there's a lot of like fun surprises the first time around so I wonder if it's still as exciting watching it again yeah and I know you take rewatchability into consideration I I don't always because the first time you see a movie, like movies with plot twists, you can really only judge it off your first viewing because you know what's going to happen anytime after that. Rewatchability to me is just how good was it? How good was the acting? Is it something worth like kind of watching again for that? But, yeah. Is it like, is it worth having that, ex- that experience again? And I would love yeah, to have the experience of watching this I, movie the first time yeah, again. Yeah. So something like that I don't usually take into consideration for my scores because I kind of like that first viewing experience. It's kind of like gravity. We saw that in theaters and it was like, hold your breath for two, uh, it wasn't that long, for like an hour and a half. And it was phenomenal. I I don't ever need to see that movie again because I'm never going to be able to recreate that (laughs) in the theaters, big screen kind of moment. So I give this movie a 9.5. This movie was so good. And like you said, it was so original. I don't know how anyone could write this story, like this script. Yeah. The the things that happened in this movie, I'm just like, how can someone, especially since we looked and it's an original screenplay, it's not based on anything that we can find. Like <laughs> how people think of stories like this and the, the twists that happen is just beyond me. So I, this movie was phenomenal. Uh, any other comments before we move into the spoiler section? No, just reiterating that as much as I would like people to listen, just skip ahead of this this next spoiler section area. Look at the timestamp to skip ahead of it if you haven't seen this movie because I think as many people should go see it as possible. So as we get into the spoiler section here, uh, it starts, I like we mentioned, it starts with the Kim family. It starts in their apartment where you can kind of see their sad living conditions, menial work they're doing. The son, Ki Wu, meets up with a friend who asks him to fill in as an English tutor. So like this friend of his is tutoring a girl for the wealthy Park family right now and he's going back to college and he says like he woo I trust you I know you're not an actual English tutor but I trust you to take this job and and I'll I'll vouch for you for the family basically yeah he says he kind of has like a crush on the girl too so he doesn't trust like, any other tutors to take care of her so he wants Kiwu to do it for him and mm-hmm. kind of keep an eye on her before she then goes to school yeah, so Kiwu goes to uh, the Park family's house, kind of meets meets the mom, does like his first lesson with the daughter, who she's like a high schooler or something, right? So maybe like a couple years younger than him, I think. Yeah, I'm not too, yeah. I, she's kind of younger guess, anyway. for sure. Yeah. So he has like the first lesson with her and, you know, as he's leaving and like talking more with the mom, she says, oh yeah, you know, my... 
my son, he's kind of had some issues after he saw this ghost in the basement, but you know, he's such a talented artist. I mean, the kid's like, I don't know, five, six years old, maybe. And she's like, oh, he's such a talented artist. I need someone to, to help him with his art. And he says, oh, well, you know, I think I know someone who can help with that. Like I have this friend who's a, who's an art teacher. Yeah. Well, I guess, first of all, before going into that, so to prove that he's a tutor to the Park family, he needs to have all these documents. And his sister, like, forges all of them. So early on, it shows her art skills. Like, she's using Photoshop and all these other things and and forging all these, like, uh, diplomas and, and degrees and everything to so Kiwu can prove that he's a tutor. So it kind of shows her art skills early on. And also, that's kind of uh, that scene where he's talking to the the mom about her son being a painter is one of the humor parts of it too, because he's standing there going, Oh, is this a painting of a chimpanzee? And she goes, no, it's a self portrait. And he just goes, Oh, beautiful. Like, it's just like, there's just little humor like that throughout the movie. Yeah. So next thing we know, uh, his sister is posing as the art teacher and she's working for the park family as well. So at this point you can kind of see like they're willing to, like you said, forge those documents, and take on these, you know, what we can assume aren't well-paying jobs with the family. But at least for me, like, you're still on their side. You're like, okay, these are like 20-something-year-old kids just trying to, you know, earn some money and whatever. There's there's nothing too harmless to it. But things, you, you kind of get a sense of maybe there's a little bit more to it when the first night that the sister is there, She's getting a ride home from the family's driver, and she takes off her underwear and leaves them in the back seat of the car. Yeah, that scene, I, was, I had no idea what was going on. Was, no idea where she was going with this. Like he's he's driving, not paying attention. She's in the back seat, and yeah, she takes off her underwear, and then she calls someone afterwards and says, like, "Oh, the plan is in place" or something along those lines. And it's just like, what is going on? And then. Yeah, you you realize that they're trying to get the driver fired. And then that's when it clicked, for me at least, that like, oh my god, they are, like, this entire family is trying to, like, infiltrate. Like, the, the Kim family is trying to, like, infiltrate the Park family. And this was one of my favorite scenes or parts of the entire movie is that where you see this process where they're trying to get someone who works in the park family's residence fired and then getting a family member hired. And it was just insane. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and just, just like you said, uh, and the, the dad, Mr. Kim, had done, like, driving, like, taxi work before, so it, it kind of made sense. But, yeah, you see the daughter taking these steps to get her dad hired there and so of course you know she comes back again and and the kim family is like oh my gosh yeah i think we're gonna have to fire this driver and oh blah 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 and very similar to as her brother did said oh well i know someone what does she say it's like her uncle i think yeah maybe uh yeah, she said hey right. like you know one of my uncles he he used to be a driver and what's so crazy is so then you see uh, Mr. Mr. Kim and his son, like, at the local BMW dealership checking out the car so he can, you know, even further, like, with this plan of, oh, yes, I've always been a driver and I drive for very wealthy people and I know my stuff. And really, he's just sitting in a BMW in a dealership to try to figure out how to work the car, you mm-hmm. know? Um, but, yeah, so, again, it's, like, now three of them are working for the family and the parks just love them and they're around them all the time and they do pretty much everything for them. Now the tough thing is the park family's housekeeper. She was the housekeeper for the previous owner, which was like the architect who like designed and built the house. So she's been there a long time. She's like the end all be all, like everything, like the, the park family runs through her. And so you see the Kims trying to figure out, okay, how can we get rid of the housekeeper now? This is going to be the tough one. But they find out she's allergic to peaches. And they kind of use that to make it seem like she's sick. And they they get Mrs. 
Park to believe that she has tuberculosis (laughs) of all things. She's got tuberculosis and, oh my gosh, you can't have that around your family. You can't have that around the kids. And so Mrs. Park just thinks, oh gosh, yes, you guys know what you're doing and you know what you're saying and I completely trust you. And I think, yeah, I think to that point it's worth noting that the original tutor, uh, Kiwa's friend, who kind of like get set, you know, like gets him hired on as a tutor admits and se- and kind of warns them or says like hey mrs park is a little naive yeah so it's worth noting she believes them but like it's set up that way mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so next one you know housekeeper is gone and who do we have as the new housekeeper it's mrs kim yeah and i i do i said it earlier i love that whole sequence where they kind of take someone out one at a time and they get a family member added on and what i really loved about it was just how well done the director handled it or did it because i think if this could have been in someone else's hands they could have just laid it out for the viewer like they could have just said okay we're gonna do this this and this but what i really liked about it is we didn't really know what was going on they didn't over explain it or anything like that they the director let the viewer kind of figure it out as we went along. And I think that's what made it so awesome is like, we're figuring it out. You know, it's kind of the opposite in movies. The viewer kind of knows things that the characters don't know in the movie, but Mm -hmm. it was kind of vice versa in this case where the characters, they have this plan laid out and we're watching, trying to figure out what's going on. And I I thought that it was so well done. Yeah, I agree. It it was fun figuring that stuff out and it was, they gave you enough clues that you could get there, but mm-hmm. not too much where you're like, okay, this is totally predictable. I mean, it was predictable in the sense that you go, okay, so we know the whole family is going to start working for them, but how are we going to get there? So you're right. I think that was really fun to figure out. So once mom is hired, this is where the whole movie takes a turn. Yeah. Well, it's already like at first you think it's just the son being a tutor and finally making money for the family. And then, oh, the sister comes on. Okay, like you said earlier. Yeah, they're, it's, it's they're these exploiting two, them a little bit. Yeah, okay. But whatever, it's these two young kids. But then, it yeah, it takes a, a turn where it's like this whole family, they're lying and infiltrating. And then, yeah, like what well, you're gonna about to say, it, this movie takes another turn. Yeah, so the Park family is out for a camping weekend for their, like, the younger son's birthday. And so the whole... Kim family is like, oh, perfect. We have a whole weekend in this rich, fancy, wealthy people's house. Let's just, you know, drink all their booze and eat their food and kind of enjoy uh, what we've done for ourselves. Yeah. They're like having a vacation. They're like having like a stay- yeah. staycation, but in like someone else's house. Yeah. So, of course, uh, things take a turn when the old housekeeper comes back and she comes into the house saying, oh, yeah, I, you know, I forgot something here and I wasn't given a chance to get all my things, so I just need to go into the basement and grab a few things. And, of course, it's dark out and it's raining. Really sets the tone, right? So she goes downstairs and she's been gone for a little while, so Mrs. Kim goes down there to see what's going on. And this really freaked me out at first as I'm like, is this lady, like, not a human? Because you literally see her parallel to the ground she has her feet up against the wall and her hands push up against a bookcase i'm like is she like a crazy person like what is yeah. happening or is she just pissed that she lost her job is she gonna like murder these people like it, it's like you you don't know what's going you on don't know what's going on and so uh, so they kind of she she runs downstairs and the housekeeper is like i said trying to push this bookcase open kind of goes what the heck she gets it open and just starts running down this this bunker yeah into this bunker and turns out the housekeeper's husband who's super loony like super crazy he's been living in this secret bunker built underneath the house that the architect designer of the house built there you know decades before and so her husband has been living in this house and she hasn't been able to bring food to him for the last week or two or whatever she isn't working there anymore and so, uh, so I think, is it just the mom? I think, is it just Mrs. Kim that's down there with the housekeeper and husband at first? And, like, the rest of the family is kind of, like, hiding on the stairs? Yeah, like, like, yeah, she goes, because, so, okay, so, 
the the old housekeeper and the Park family, they don't know that they're all related, that the Kim family are all related, other yep. than maybe the the dad and daughter are yeah, they say they're... A, a uncle and niece, but they don't know they're all related. So the only person who should be at the Park house right now is the mom because she's the housekeeper. Yes. So when the doorbell rings and the old housekeeper shows up, the other three go hiding. So that's why, yeah, when she gets this bunker open and they go downstairs, it's only Mrs. Uh, Kim who's down there with her. And the, yeah. the other three family members are kind of on the staircase hiding but trying to hear what's going on. But, yeah, it's just absolutely insane. This is kind of, you alluded to it earlier, this is, like, why that why she wanted to, they say in the movie that the housekeeper wanted to stay with the Park family even though like, she had worked for the previous owner, but she wanted to stay in the house working for the new family, and you like find out why. It's because she had been keeping her husband in this bunker that the Park family doesn't even know about. Yeah, they don't know about him And at she all. just brings her husband food like once a day or once a week or whatever it is every, every once in a while. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so as, as Mrs. Kim is down there with the old housekeeper, um... You know, the, the dad, the son and daughter kind of like sneak down there too. And one of them trips or something, boom. All three of them, like the entire Kim family is there. And you see the son who's like, oh, dad, oh. And so that's when the housekeeper's like, oh, I know what's going on here now. And she like has, she took like a, a video on her camera of this whole thing. And so she threatens, oh, I can tell Mr. and Mrs. Park about this whole thing and you've been lying to them and you're exploiting them and blah, blah, blah. So now it's this whole, okay, we need to take care of the housekeeper. We got to take care of her husband. Like we can't let this like good thing that we have come to an end. So of course, to add craziness to this, um, the, the mom gets a call from Mrs. Park saying, hey, you know what, with the weather and everything, we're actually just going to come back right now, tonight. Um, we'll be there in eight minutes. Yeah, she's <laughs> just eight minutes out. And yeah, I think when the phone goes off or something, everyone gets distracted. And that's when the Kim family kind of tackles or goes after the housekeeper and her husband. And that's why... Because she's basically holding them hostage with this phone, saying like, "Oh, I'm about to press send, about to press send," and they get distracted, and that, and so that's kind of what happens, and yeah, all hell kind of breaks loose. So yeah, they they end up tying up the housekeeper and her husband like in the bunker to keep the story from getting out. They like close the bookcase, and um, Mrs. Kim just goes back upstairs like nothing ever happened. And, you know, her, her husband, the son and daughter, they're all hiding under this, like, massive, I don't even want to call it a coffee table because it's just, like, this giant table in the middle of, like, the living room. And they're, like, hiding out there for the night. And they can't do anything. They can't get out because the little kid is camping out in the backyard. And Mr. and Mrs. Park say, oh, how about we just, like, stay on the couch tonight and keep an eye on him so they're like trapped under this table mm. they can't get out basically you know and one thing that you know you've seen the parks and the kims get along so well and they just trust each other so much but you kind of see a different side of the park family here when mr and mrs park are laying on the couch and they're like oh gosh it it smells like mr kim and the mom just kind of laughs she's like what are you talking about you know and um Mr. Park's like, yeah, you know, Mr. Kim, the driver, he he smells bad. Like he he smells. What does he say? He's like he smells like old radishes yeah, or like. He's basically smelling, saying he like smells like a poor person. Yeah, because that, that's when this movie really like it's kind of based on class a little bit because you have this rich family and poor family. But this is really when it gets into like clashing between the classes because. When you find out that the old housekeeper's husband is living in the bunker, you find out it's because they're poor and they can't afford, like, a house. Like, he has to live down there because she sleeps there as the housekeeper. Like, she lives in the house and they can't afford a house, like, a house of their own. So he's living in the bunker because they can't afford it. So he's showing, like, the difference in class and kind of the clash between them. Because, yeah, like you said, the, the dad starts saying things like, oh, I think I can smell Mr. 
Mr. Kim, and it, he's alluding to, like, I can smell the pour on him. And uh, Yeah, he says once, like, oh, he smells like a Subway or something like that. So, you know, you kind of see their reactions as they're hiding under the table, like, mm, gosh, you know, we thought we were really close with them, but maybe they do actually have different feelings about us. So the next morning, the parks decide to have, since they didn't do their camping trip for their son's birthday, they say, hey, how about we have some friends over um, and throw him a birthday party. Yeah. And the Kim family was able to sneak out eventually. Yeah, they they're, were. They're able to. So yeah, they have a party in the front yard and, you know, they offer, um, they extend an invite to the whole Kim family saying, hey, you know, we'd love for you to come to the birthday party. That'd be great. Uh, you know, in the back of their mind, they're kind of thinking, oh my gosh, like we have the housekeeper and her husband tied up in the basement. Oh my God. Yeah. It's also worth the, uh, the, ho- the old housekeeper at this point. I think she's dead because to get her back into the bunker, Mrs. Kim kind of kicks her down the stairs and she hits her head. The old housekeeper hits her yeah. head. Like the impact doesn't kill her, but I think it's a loss of blood. Later. She says she thinks she has a concussion or something. So they kind of, they drag her downstairs into the bottom of the bunker and she ends up dying. So now we her, just have her husband tied who's, up. Who's now. tied up and he's upset, obviously. Yeah. So during the midst of this party, so I'm going to break this down as best I can. The housekeeper's husband gets free from the bunker and as he's coming up out of the basement the son ki Wu, is there and the housekeeper's husband hits him over the head with this rock we you know he's just completely bleeding out he moves on goes up the steps through the kitchen to the outside and Ends up stab. He grabs a knife because they're like barbecuing or something like that. Yeah, he grabs a knife from the kitchen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. He grabs a knife from the kitchen and ends up stabbing Kiwu's sister, the one who's posing as the art teacher. So now, Mr. Kim, who's there, everyone thinks, oh, yeah, you're the driver, whatever. He runs to his daughter's attention to try to take care of her. Meanwhile, the park's son has a seizure because if you remember, the mom said, oh, yeah, he saw a ghost in the basement. Well, the ghost had been the housekeeper's husband sneaking up from the bunker to get food, a, you know, a year or two or whatever before then. So he sees his ghost again and starts having a seizure. So the park's like, oh, my God, we have to get our son to we have to get him to the hospital. So Mr. Kim, you got to drive us. You're our driver. And he's like, "Um, no, this is my daughter. They don't know that, but I need to take care of my daughter. So they throw, he throws the keys, and that ends up getting entangled under Mrs. Kim, yeah. who's now taken a barbecue fork, kills the housekeeper's husband. Yeah, the guy that was in the bunker. Yep, yep. So the keys are under there, and as Mr. Park is trying to get the keys out from under Mrs. Kim... You can see him hold his nose like, ooh, this lady smells. She smells like a poor person. And that triggers Mr. Kim. He grabs the knife that that the housekeeper's husband, who had been living in the bunker, like took from the kitchen and used to stab uh, Mr. Kim's daughter. He grabs that knife and goes up to Mr. Park and stabs him. So it's this like absolute massacre happening here. You see Mr. Kim kind of sneak out, get away from it all. And this is where like you have the first just kind of like cut and you're like, oh my God, like what just happened? This is one of the moments where I'm like, um, is the movie over? Like, yeah. I wasn't sure where we were going from there. Yeah. Because, yeah, Mr. Mr. Kim, like, leaves the house. He kind of goes out through the garage, you know, and in theory goes out on the street and runs away. And the, the Kiwu is still just bleeding out in the basement. And the mom, their mom is trying to attend to Take their care daughter. Of the daughter. And so it kind of goes forward a little bit in time. I can't remember how much, but... It's revealed that the daughter ends up dying. Yep. Ki Wu survives somehow. He get he got hit in the, in the head twice with a giant rock by this guy, but he was in the hospital. He recovers. 
him and his mom are up on trial and they're they're put on probation. They're not put in jail, but they're put on probation. The Park family moves out of that house. And uh, so Kiwu kind of walks uh, by that house every once in a while just to like see it and, you know, relive some of those memories, good and bad. And this is when something happens that takes another turn. So throughout the movie uh, in this house, the garage is below the living area. So there's this stairway that comes from the garage into the living room. And they have these motion sensor lights where, like, as you're walking up the stairs, the lights turn on for you. And throughout the movie, they're, they're kind of like, oh, those lights have been kind of acting weird lately. We need to get them replaced. But it's revealed later on that the housekeeper's husband, who's been living in the basement, they aren't motion sensor lights. He literally turns them on and off for the Park family as he can hear them walking up and down the stairs. Like he, I said, he's there's just there's, crazy. there's switches bol- like in the basement that he turns on and off for them. They aren't motion like it's just insane. They aren't motion censored. He just is controlling them. Yeah, he hears them start like going up the stairs, and he like hits the light switch like boom, boom, boom as the people are going up yeah. the steps, and it's so freaky. Because he like in his mind, he's he's like been down there so long and is so like insane at this point that he thinks he's built he's built a relationship with the Park yeah. family because he's basically talking to them like, oh, welcome home from work, Mr. Park. Like he's saying that as he's turning on the lights. And I bring that up because when Kiwu is sitting kind of in a distance on a hill, but he can see like the whole living room and everything because it's like a big glass paneled house. So you can kind of see inside. He sees the lights are flickering and, and it's Morris code they kind of bring up Morris code a couple times throughout the movie and he realizes it's it's, it's Morris code and his dad never left the house he like went, he didn't escape outside like no, run he, away from the house he went he went down and out into the garage but then went back into the garage and through the staircase and down into the bunker and is now living in the bunker and he like does this Morris code message hoping someone can read it and it and then you know Kiwu sees it and then the, the ending of the movie is, you know, kind of nice in a sense where Q basically writes a letter back to him laying out the rest of his future where Q says, I'm going to get a good job. I'm going to make a lot of money. One day I'm going to buy that house and it's going to be the best day of our lives when you can finally walk out of that basement and we can be a family again. And it kind of shows it like it shows Q and his mom going to the house and buying it. And it shows his dad coming out from the basement and it shows them embracing so you're kind of like is that actually happening but then it cuts back to kiwu writing the letter so this, it's like a dream of his still yeah it didn't happen but it's like something. a dream of his mm-hmm. and that's kind of how the movie ends yeah it was like i said just a fantastic movie and really kept you guessing and not knowing exactly what was next and such an original idea i just like you said i can't believe someone came up with this i'm impressed that people are so creative and can come up with such a well thought out story so this Mm -hmm. was a very very entertaining movie highly recommended go see it worth worth the watch yes yep worth the watch for sure so now that we've wrapped up parasite Let's move on to the Best Picture winner that we are featuring this week, and that is No Country for Old Men, which is from 2007. It was written and directed by the Coen brothers. Main stars are Javier Bardem, Josh Brolin, and Tommy Lee Jones. Uh, Do you want me to kind of state up front here some of the awards it was nominated for, things that it won, or do we want to get into that a little bit later? No, yeah, you can go ahead. Okay. So it was nominated for eight awards, and it won four of them, obviously including Best Picture. Javier Bardem also won for Best Actor in a Supporting Role. The Coen Brothers won for Directing and also for Adapted Screenplay. The movie was also nominated for Cinematography, Film Editing, sound editing and sound mixing so it won some of the bigger categories i guess you could say and more of the technical stuff for the ones that they had nominations but did not win on yeah which sim- cinematography well i guess i'd look and see what one i bet you there will be blood one instead but uh i would say 
I'm surprised it didn't win cinematography because this is really beautifully. It's a real like a neo western, so it's got a lot of beautiful shots. But now that I think about it, I bet you there will be Blood One instead because that also has beautiful shots as well. So what, what's that movie about again? There will be Blood. Yeah. Uh, it's the Daniel Day Lewis, which he won Best Actor for that one, where he plays a, a oil rig, like monger kind of in a way. He goes to places and. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we watched the trailer for that because I couldn't remember yeah. what that was. So yep. he, yeah, he kind of, he tries finding oil in these areas, and yeah, that's what that movie is kind of about. So yeah, this movie, as I mentioned, it's kind of a neo western, like a more modern ish uh, movie with western themes. It takes place in 1980. Uh, it opens in Texas. With Javier Bardem, uh, he's he got arrested. We don't know exactly what for. This is based off a book, so maybe it more is explained in that. But he's a, he's arrested, and it, it opens with a bang because uh, the officer that arrests him has his back to Javier Bardem while he's on the phone talking to someone. And Javier this, Bardem. This is like in the jail, right? It's in the or... the station. He yeah. isn't yes, in yes. jail yet, but it's in the police station. And Javier Bardem, literally, he just stands up, walks up behind the officer, and puts a, the he's cuffed obviously, and puts the cuffs underneath his chin, and literally just chokes him to death right then and there. He uh, steals a car from a guy, or he uses the throughout the whole movie. Uh, his char- Javier Bardem's character's name is Anton Chigurh. Anton has this, um, like, cattle prod machine where it, like, shoots out a pin. Yeah, they it's use like it a... To kill, s- yeah. They use it to kill cattle. And he uses it throughout the film in multiple different ways. But he at the beginning of the film, he uses it to kill a guy and then take his car. Uh, but after that, it shows Josh Brolin, who lives in Texas. Uh, he's, he lives in a trailer, kind of on the lower you know class end of things uh and he he's a hunter so he's kind of in the middle of nowhere hunting right now and he stumbles upon basically this drug deal gone wrong he just sees this open area with all these cars and dead bodies around and he walks down there to investigate finds truckloads of uh drugs and there's no money so the money's missing he finds one guy in a truck that's still kind of alive and he's just asking for water but josh brolin brolin kind of ignores him he starts tracking down the guy that uh that he thinks ran away with the money ends up finding another dead body with the money underneath this tree so he takes the money which i think they reveal is like two million dollars yeah in cash that's, yeah that sounds right which even nowadays is a lot but back in 1980 80 holy shit and so he takes the money back home uh to his wife you know he's married and in the middle of the night he kind of wakes up and goes shit and uh the wife's like what and he goes i gotta go take care of something and he grabs a gallon of water <laughs> so he's going back to give water to the guy that was dying uh, so he's doing, like, morally a good thing here. He goes back to to the guy, to the, you know, this drug deal gone wrong. Turns out that guy's dead, but he was shot. So, like, someone else has been there since Josh Brolin was there. And he looks up at his truck, and another truck is there, and they turn their headlights on. So now it's like a chase scene where Josh Brolin is running away from this truck. Because, yeah, because since someone else is there, they know that the money's gone. Yeah, like it's somewhat, we don't know exactly how they're involved. Maybe they were on the, one of the two ends of the drug deal gone wrong. But yeah, so now it's a chase scene. Josh Brolin barely gets away. He gets home, tells his wife to leave town, go visit his her mom in Odessa or something like that. Uh, and then we cut back to Anton, who is at that drug deal gone wrong, and he's now been hired to find that money and recover it. Uh, and uh, Josh Brolin, his character's name is Llewellyn Moss. His truck is still there, so he gets Llewellyn's name from the serial number on there. So he goes to Llewellyn's trailer. This is when he starts using that cattle prong thing in different ways. Where it, this guy is actually kind of cool. He puts it up against locks and like pops the lock out of doors, and that's how he gets into rooms. Yeah, because like it works on compression. Like yeah. his pin pops out. Yeah. So yeah, that's how he's killing people and opening locks. Yeah, and- which is really cool. 
and uh, Llewellyn isn't there anymore, so he's trying to track him down. And it's worth noting when when he gets hired on to do this job, he's giving this tracking device. Uh, he's given this device like it's supposed to blink when he's near the money, like it's tracking the money somehow. Yeah, like there's some sort of like transmitter in yeah. the briefcase that has the money. Yeah, so Anton has this now. It hasn't gone off or anything. And uh, Llewellyn Moss is leaving town. He's kind of just driving to uh, this random motel. And he puts the money in the vent. Yeah, the vent. He, he opens the vent up, puts the money in there, and kind of... This is what I like about the movie. It kind of shows how, how smart his character is or how resourceful his character is. He like he uses all these different poles and everything to kind of push the money around a corner so you can't really see it when you're looking in the vent. So, yeah, Llewellyn leaves for whatever reason. I can't remember what. And when he comes back to his hotel room, he notices that there's a different car. There's a car in front of his room. And he doesn't know who or why. And... He goes into the the office of the hotel, tells them he wants to rent a second room. <laughs> and the guy's like, "What? Well, that's weird, but okay, whatever. He goes, we can rent you a room right next to your, the one you're currently renting from us for whatever reason. And he goes, no, I don't want the one right next to it. How about the one that shares like the back wall with it? Because on the map it, of the layout of the rooms, it shows that those rooms share the vent. Yeah, so instead of, like, side by side, it's the two rooms that are, like, back, back to, to back. Back to back, yeah. So he rents the one in the back, uh, gets a bunch more poles, like, tents, uh, tent poles. He goes to a store, and he's like, I want to buy a tent. And the worker's like, what kind of tent do you want? And he goes, the one with most poles. <laughs> so he, he gets a bunch of poles to try to, uh, to get the money out of the vent and then get out of there because he knows someone is in his room. And that's when Anton is driving by. And the tracking device starts beeping a couple times. So Anton stops at this motel, kind of figures out which room is beeping. And it's Josh Brolin's original room. So Anton goes in there. And it's a bunch of... It's assumed to be the people that were originally driving Josh Brolin down in the original chase scene. So Anton Sugar just goes into this room, shoots and kills everyone that's in there, sees like Hispanic people, and uh, shoots and kills all of them, notices that something was up with the vent, like the screws were loose or something like that, opens it up and sees these like track marks, like something was dragged through it, and then you see that Josh Brolin, who heard all these gunshots going off, like got the money and he did he got out of there and he's like driving south towards the border ends up getting a different hotel room in a different hotel and he kind of gets all set up there puts the money down turns off the lights and he's laying there and it's kind of another kind of funny dark humor moment he's laying there and he goes no fucking way and he turns the lights back on and that's kind of him realizing there's no way that that was a coincidence that these people found me randomly so he realizes that there has to be something in the money. So he does. He starts looking through the case of full money and he finds the tracking device, which is how the Anton and then that other group of people uh, found him. Okay, yeah. I was going to ask, how did like the other people that were in Llewellyn's first room, I couldn't remember yeah. how they got there. So they were tracking the money. Yeah, so it, it, turned, too, kind it of. turns out the person that hired Anton hired a bunch of other people. And that comes up in the story later on because Anton didn't really like that too much. But anyway, so he's in this hotel, he realizes that this tracking device is in there, and then that's when, this is the part that I know is a really tense part for you, but you probably re really liked it. <laughs> Anton shows up at that hotel, you don't really see him, it's all shadow, it's like he, he, it's from the point of view of Josh Brolin, where he's, the lights are off in his room, he has a shotgun on him now at this point, and you can see light coming out from the bottom of his door, like, in the hallway. Through the hallway, yeah. And you see these footprint, like, these two feet there. And then they walk away, and the lights go out. So, like, Anton's there, but he turns off the lights. So now he comes, you don't know, but he's coming back. And then, bam, Josh Brolin gets hit in the chest with the lock because he's using the compressor on the lock again. <laughs> and Josh Brolin gets hit in the chest by the lock, and now they start shooting at each other, and it's this... Huge but awesome, like, kind of cat and mouse chase scene that's going on. So I just, I love this scene uh, because, again, it's showing the resourcefulness of Josh Brolin. Like, he's getting away from Anton Shiger, who's, like, 
the embodiment of death, as some characters say in this movie. Because while all this is going on, I mentioned the guy that hired Anton is hiring these other people too. He also hires Woody Harrelson's character, like Woody Harrelson's in this movie. He's another hitman, and he hires Woody Harrelson to like t get control of the situation. So Woody Harrelson is like. Yeah, okay, I'll try to handle it. I've, I'm one of the few people that have dealt with Anton and survived. And the guy that hires him, who is uh, Stephen Root, the guy from Barry. Yeah. <laughs> and the guy from Dodgeball, who has the glasses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but he's the, the businessman hiring people to get this money for him. But he looks at Woody Harrelson and he's like, how bad is he? And Woody Harrelson has that line where he goes, compared to what? The bubonic plague? So, like, it's set up that Anton is his ultimate bad guy. But Josh Brolin is finding ways to evade him, which I think was awesome throughout the movie. Uh, and so, like, they have this huge shootout. They both get injured. It was kind of cool. Josh Brolin finds a way to actually kind of hit Anton in a way. So they, they're both injured. They, they both get away. And uh, Josh Brolin, who's injured, they're on a border. They're in a border town, so he goes to Mexico to get help because he doesn't want to go to the police or anything. But while he's crossing the border into Mexico, he tosses the briefcase of money over, like, a fence into this, like, wooded area. And he wakes up in a hospital in Mexico, and Woody Harrelson's there. <laughs> and Woody Harrelson's like, listen, I found you pretty easily. Like, how easily do you think Anton's going to find you? Uh, so... You know, it's kind of like Woody Harrelson's trying to, try, quote unquote, help him get him out of this mess. And uh, Josh Brolin kind of brushes it off like, no, I, I can handle this myself. So Bro Brolin gets healed up. He goes and gets the gets the money, crosses back into the United States and then uh, hides out in a different motel again. And while that's going on, Anton heals himself up. And then he goes to Stephen Root's character, who's the guy that hired him, and he's kind of pissed that, like, he found out that Woody Harrelson got hired on, and Anton actually ends up killing him. But, like, he's he's pissed that, like, these people get hired and getting in his way, so he actually goes and shoots and kills Stephen Root's character. Uh, but anyways, it, it, it kind of comes, not to a head, but after that happens, Tommy Lee Jones, I feel bad I haven't even mentioned his name yet, Tommy Lee Jones is a deputy throughout this whole movie who is trying to investigate this drug deal. So he's kind of like one or two steps behind everyone throughout this whole thing. So he's there the whole time, just one or two steps behind. And uh, he tracks down Llewellyn, and he's on his way to the motel that Llewellyn Moss is staying at. But in the distance, you hear a bunch of gunshots go off, and this truck kind of peel out. So Llewellyn has been killed by Hispanics or the people involved in the drug deal killed him. It wasn't Anton. And so Tommy Lee Jones goes to the hotel, sees Llewellyn's dead body, kind of sits in the hotel room alone. And you see Anton's in the hotel room because he's there to get the money. And you kind of for a moment think, oh my God, is he going to kill Tommy Lee Jones? But he doesn't. He lets Tommy Lee Jones leave and and you, you see track marks in the vent, so that's like their way of saying Anton took the money and he got out of there. Uh, after that, there's a funeral scene for Llewellyn, and then his wife goes back home and Anton is there in the house. Because earlier in the movie, they had a phone call, not they as in the wife, but uh, Anton and uh, Llewellyn had a phone call while Llewellyn was in Mexico, basically saying, if you give me the money now, I won't. Like Anton was saying, I won't kill your wife or anyone you know and josh Brown was like hung up on him saying like no i'll outsmart you so anton took that as well i promised i'd kill you if uh you know i promised i'd kill you if this went bad so he does this thing where he flips a coin and he tells people to call it and if they get it right he doesn't kill them and if they get it wrong they he kills them uh so they don't show but it's alluded that he kills her uh he he leaves their house, gets in a car accident, which seemed kind of random. Just puts his arm in a sling and leaves. Uh, and then the last scene is basically you see that Tommy Lee Jones retired, and that's the end of the movie. Yeah. So that's a very long-winded, but, like, explanation of, like, what happens in this movie. 
What do you what your, what were your reactions to this movie when we first saw it? I know it's been a little while, but yeah, I, I would say like the first two thirds of this movie were really good. I like how you describe it. It is kind of like a neo western. It takes place in Texas, and it's got kind of this western feel to it, and this you know cat and mouse going back and forth trying to I'm trying to evade you, and you're trying to get me. So I really liked that part kind of going back and forth but then yeah it was really weird how then all of a sudden like Llewellyn gets shot and killed off screen and I didn't necessarily see kind of how Llewellyn's wife like I'm like why why did Anton really have to go back and kill her but I guess like that's kind of the person he is it's like a more yeah it's like a principal thing with yeah like uh like, he gave Llewellyn an out for his family, mm-hmm. and Llewellyn didn't take it. So yeah. he's like, okay, well, I have to kill her, or, or flip the coin and, and you know, possibly kill her. Make it's like an a excuse, thing yeah, yeah. So then it was, like, I didn't really like that. And like you said, then all of a sudden he gets in a car, in a car crash, and Tylee Jones is like, oh, I'm too old for this crap kind of thing. It's like, what? So I don't know, the, the ending was not... Uh, not as good as the rest of the movie, but on the whole, I I really liked it. I thought it was really thrilling. I didn't fall asleep, uh, so that's always that's, a win. that's always good. Sometimes I fall asleep, uh, so I did. I I like this movie. If we're giving out scores right now, I gave this one an eight point three. I'd say it's worth the watch. Uh, Coen Brothers always put together really good movies, so I I thought it was really great. You copied my score. Oh, out. No. I also gave it an 8.3. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've seen this movie three times. First time was in theaters with a bunch of like high school friends. And after it, we were all kind of like, what was that? Like that, like that was not that great, but we were in high school and whatever. Saw it second time, thought it was better. And then this third time with you and I've liked it more and more each time. But I couldn't agree with you more in the sense of, like, the first two-thirds or half of this movie, probably more so two-thirds, is fantastic. It is cat and mouse, one guy trying to outsmart the other and running away from him. I love that whole Josh Brolin versus Anton Chigurh aspect of it. Like, it was really well done and thought it was really tense when it needed to be and, you know, kind of funny in certain parts and creative but that, to me, as soon as he the, he gets to Mexico, Luella Moss, like, from that point on, I think the movie, it really comes to, a, like, a halt. Like, it, I lose interest. It gets a little boring from part of time to time. I hate, I'll, I'll just talk about some of the things that I didn't like about the movie right now. I hate that Josh Brolin's character gets killed off screen and it isn't even Anton that kills him. Yeah, it was... Like, the, what's the point? Like, him and Anton have been, like, having this back and forth throughout the movie, and he gets killed off screen, and it isn't even Anton. And I know this is based on a book, so you gotta, like, stick to that to a certain point, but, man, I really... I, I did not like that part. Well, and I think for me, so... Uh, honestly, like, the, the stuff that was going on at the beginning where, like, Llewellyn comes across the the shootout and the bad drug deals. I did not really understand what was going on. So I'm glad you had seen this before because you kind of explained to me like, hey, here's kind of what's what's going on. And so I can understand like the first time you saw it, you're like, what the heck was that? I would probably have the same feeling if I didn't have you like explaining certain things to me or making sure like, hey, do you know what's going on? Um, Because it was, I think it was a little confusing. But once I understood like what was going on and the whole like Llewellyn versus Anton thing gets going, I'm like, okay, this is really exciting. And then, yeah, we get to the end, and I just... It didn't seem like it fit the same, like, pace. It didn't fit the no, same... No, I do, yeah. I think it slowed down. Like, the pacing had been pretty good and quick up to that point, because it's these intense chase scenes. And then as soon as he gets to Mexico, it just slows down. And, yeah, I just... I don't know. I didn't, I didn't mind the scene with the wife at the end. I don't like seeing wives get killed. <laughs> well, you didn't see it happen. Well, you know what I mean, though. <laughs> I know. But, yeah, it just, the ending just slowed down a ton for me. So I just, I didn't love that. But, I mean, things I did like, I mean, we've kind of talked about a lot of them already. I love the back and forth between Brolin and Anton. 
and uh, how they were kind of outsmarting each other. Especially, like, how Anton's character is, like, portrayed as this, like, ultimate hitman. But here's this guy, this hunter who lives in a trail park, trailer park. He's finding ways to outsmart him. Like, I really like that. And Javier Bardem is phenomenal in this movie. This is, like, one of the best roles, uh, to me, of all time. He is like, the perfect... This is, like, He's one of the best like roles. He's, like, emotionless, creepy. I, I have the IMDb page open right now, and I forget how awesome this movie poster is because it does have that, like, Western feel, but the background is just... A close up of Javier Bardem's face, this just like yeah. blank, menacing stare. I love the little things he does throughout the movie. Like he does it a couple times. We talked about where he flips a coin, and he call, tells people to call it. Like that scene. It's early in the movie. It might be one of the first scenes when he's in that gas station, that Texaco, and he's just talking to the gas station attendant. And he does. He flips the coin and he tells him call it. You know, call it, and the guy he calls it right, so like Anton doesn't kill him. But he has this speech where he's like, "No, you hang on to that. That's your lucky coin now. Like you hang on to it." That whole scene was cool. So I like that trade of it where like he flips the coin. The compressor was really cool. Like how he used it to open doors and unfortunately, you know, to kill some people too. But his character was just so good. Very and original. Right, rightfully so, he won the an Oscar for his role in this. Like it was, he was phenomenal. Uh, and you mentioned it with the poster with, like, this cool Western background. It, this movie looks awesome. Like, I, I, we talked about the cinematography nomination, all the wide-open kind of Western scenes with these, like, kind of desert backgrounds and everything. Like, this movie does look beautiful, too. So that that's all I had for No Country for Old Men. I always kind of look at... Uh, the other best picture nominees and everything for that year and this time around I kind of feel like I might do this for the more recent stuff like the 90s to present because that's when we were actually watching al alive for these movies and have seen a lot of the other movies that were uh, not only nominated but just came out uh, throughout the year I kind of decided to go through and, and in a way like redo <laughs> some of these nominees for some of the bigger categories so Looking at Best Supporting Actress, uh, Tilda Swinton won for Michael Clayton, which we've seen. She's so good in that movie. And that's, I really actually, like that movie. And actually, we'll get to it with the Best Picture nominees later, but that's my like favorite movie out of this year because I just love courtroom dramas and like investigative movies. Uh, but she won. like This category, I probably wouldn't change a whole lot, but just no. Tilda won. Uh, Kate Blanchett was nominated. For I'm Not There. Uh, Ruby D was nominated. She plays uh, Mama Lucas in American Gangster. Have you seen Have you seen that movie no. with Denzel? She plays Denzel Washington's character's mother mm. in that movie. Uh, this was Sher Saoirse Ronan's first Oscar nomination at the age of like 13 for Atonement. Uh, and then this one is cool because I've said it before. I like it when movies kind of sometimes getting the nomination is a win. Amy Ryan, who plays, uh, uh, what's her name in The Office? The She ends up marrying Michael Scott. Oh, Holly? Holly, yeah. She plays Holly in The Office. She got an Oscar nomination for Gone Baby Gone, which was Ben Affleck's directorial debut, and it starred his brother, Casey. Oh, my she, gosh. I don't remember her in that movie. She's the but mother. But I really like that movie. She's the mother of the girl that gets hmm. kidnapped, so mm -hmm. she's like the druggy mm -hmm. addict. Yep. Oh, so, my gosh. That's probably why I didn't recognize her. Yeah, so I, I probably wouldn't change a lot there, but just a couple things to note, which were cool. So Best Sporting Actor, we've already talked about Harvey at Bardem won. I mean, that shouldn't change. He needed to win that. Uh, Casey Affleck, this was his first nomination for uh, The Assassination of Jesse James by the Coward Robert Ford. Long title. Super long title. Uh, I, remember, I, I watched this yeah, recently. We, yeah, we you watched were, that. Yeah, we yeah. did. That's a good movie. It's long, but that's, I mean, we've talked about cinematography with No Country for Old Men. Cinematography, that actually might have won. <laughs> I said maybe There Will Be Blood did. The cinematography in that movie is ridiculous. But yeah, so Philip Seymour Hoffman got nominated for Charlie Wilson's War. Hal Holbrook was nominated for Into the Wild. And Tom Wilkinson was nominated for Michael Clayton. And again, Michael Clayton was made my favorite movie out of the year. And he plays like the crazy, the, the attorney that kind of loses his mind in that movie. And he was phenomenal. 
Uh, so next up, Best Actress was won by Marion. How do I say your last name? Cotillard. Co- Cotillard. Sorry I think, for n- I don't not know. getting that. I feel name. like I say it half Spanish, half <laughs> French. Or some, I don't know. That's what I go with. Marion Cotillard. Yes. Yeah, so I don't know. She won for Levy and Rose, where she played uh, Edith Pilaf. I never saw this movie, but I heard, I mean. <laughs> Pilaf. Oh, Pilaf. <laughs> like Pilaf Rice. Or the villain. He's a villain in Dragon Ball. That might have been oh where that God. came from. Edith Piaf. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and then Kate Blanchett was also nominated for Elizabeth, The Golden Age, which it's a sequel to Elizabeth, which she was nominated for in 1998. And she was nominated for that one as well. Julie Christie was nominated for Away From Her, which I think she won... The Golden Globe, actually, for this role. Th- this year, for this award, it was kind of a race between Julie Christie and Marion, and Marion ended up winning. Uh, Laura Linney was nominated for The Savages, and then Ellen Page was nominated for Juno. I think it's her only nomination, but Juno uh, was a kind of a surprise hit of that year. So out of those, uh, you know, I kind of try to bring up snubs. So this is where I might start rearranging things. Uh, I would possibly take out Kate Blanchett, because she was also nominated for Best Supporting Actress that year, which I kind of brought up. And this movie, Elizabeth the Golden Age, isn't really considered... Like, her performance is considered good. Obviously, she got nominated, but the movie isn't really considered to be that good. I would maybe take her nomination out, and I would plug in Kira Knightley for Atonement. Okay. Because I thought she was really good in that movie. I haven't seen that. Yeah, and I... But I don't really like Kira Knightley, I know, so I'm going to say, mm, I disagree. I, I On principle, but I, I don't like Kira Knightley. I didn't know if you would like that or not, but I, I would, that's where my re- rearranging things might start. Uh, I would maybe take out Kate Blanchett and put in Kira Knightley. Uh, best actor was won by, surprise, surprise, Daniel Day-Lewis for There Will Be Blood. Uh, he should win. George Clooney was nominated for uh, Michael Clayton. Which I, I've talked about enough. I, I love George Clooney is great in that movie too. Johnny Depp. This was his last Oscar nomination, at least to date. He was nominated for Sweeney Todd. Tommy Lee Jones was nominated for In the Valley of Ela. So not not No Country for Old Men, but In the Valley of Ela, which I've seen. I don't think I've even heard of it. He plays the father of, uh, like his son is in the war, like Iraq. It's like present day ish. Uh, he's over in the, the war and gets killed. And so it, it's like a movie is about his, his dad going like on this journey and like trying to investigate how his son was killed. Cause they're saying it was like an accident or something. And he doesn't believe it. So he's trying to investigate how his son was killed. It's really good. Uh, and he's good in it, but I'll talk about it in a second, but I might pull him out of this Oscar nomination. Uh, the last nomination was Viggo Mortensen for Eastern Promises, and this was his first nomination, uh, which I think was rightfully so. But the, the one change I would make here is I would take out Tommy Lee Jones, and I would put in Emile Hirsch for Into the Wild, because that movie was so good, and I don't think it got the recognition it deserved. And I think Emile Hirsch was so good in it that I think he deserved a nomination for that movie. So that's where I would make a change. Well, and most of the movie is just him. Like, it's just yeah, him by himself. So you really have to carry exactly. no, the load. So. You're, you're exactly right. It's kind of like Tom Hanks and Castaway. He carried that movie. Uh, so, yeah, I think Emil Hirsch definitely deserved a nomination there. Uh, best Director, won by the Coen Brothers. And uh, other nominees, I'm going to get this name wrong, Julian... Schnabel. Schnabel. Okay, for... I don't know who that is. The di- me either. The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Jason Reitman for Juno. Tony Gilroy for Michael Clayton. And Paul Thomas Anderson for There Will Be Blood. The change that I would maybe make here is... I thought about taking Julian out just because... I don't know who that is and I haven't seen that movie. But I watched a trailer for it. And I need to see this movie. What is it about? I... I'm not entirely sure, which sounds weird, me saying I need to see this movie, but it reminds me a lot of I have another movie that I unfortunately haven't seen but want to see, but is The Untouchables. So the, oh, okay. So this movie, The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, is a foreign film, 
uh, similar to in, Untouchables is too, but uh, we'll have to watch the trailer later. I'll show it to you, but I, I'm not taking him out. He won a bunch of awards for this. He was, he was up for a Director's Guild Award, so I'm leaving him in there, taking out Jason Reitman, and I'm putting in, I would want to put in Tim Burton. He's never, for Sweeney for Todd. For Sweeney Todd. He's never gotten a best, from what I can remember, he's never gotten a best director nomination. And I think he deserves it for that. You know, if, if he wouldn't have gotten it, maybe Sean Penn for Into the Wild. But Tim Burton is who I would have given a nomination to. And then the last category I'm kind of looking at here is uh, Best Picture, obviously. So No Country for All Men won. Other nominees were Atonement, Juno, Michael Clayton, and There Will Be Blood. So my favorite, as I've said out of all those, is Michael Clayton. Like, I get why No Country for Old Men won. And a lot of people say the the actual runner-up or the movie that maybe should have won was actually There Will Be Blood, which I agree is a, a great movie. It's just, if I'm saying favorites, Michael Clayton is my favorite. But what I would do here is I would take out Atonement, which it won the Golden Globe for Best Picture in a Drama. It... it had a lot of star power. James McAvoy, Kieran Knightley, a, a young Saoirse Ronan. I was a pretty, I was a little underwhelmed by that movie when I saw it. I was expecting a lot of bigger things out of it, and it just didn't meet my expectations. So I would take that out, and I would put in a movie that I think was very snubbed in this year, other than getting a Best Supporting Actress nomination that I mentioned earlier, is American Gangster. Mm-hmm. It's a Ridley Scott movie starring Denzel Washington and Russell Crowe. Can't get much better than that. Like, I mean, Denzel Washington plays a, like a drug kingpin that no one knows about, and Russell Crowe works for uh, like the FBI or something like that, and accidentally finds out about Frank Lucas, Denzel Washington's character, and starts investigating him. Like I, I really like that movie, and I think it got completely snubbed here, so I would have given it a Best Picture nomination there. So... I don't know, that's kind of a new thing I wanted to try out where I kind of look at the bigger categories and maybe shuffle some things around. So those those were my thoughts there. Awesome. I have nothing else to add there. So if we want, we can move on to... I've put together... So this week, instead of doing the Six Degrees of Separation, I decided to put together a quiz for Matt and test his movie knowledge. Mm-hmm. So are you ready? think so. Okay. So, as we've already discussed, Javier Bardem won Best Supporting Actor this year, making him the first Spanish actor to win an Academy Award. He was also the first Spanish actor nominated for an Academy Award. Do you know which film he earned that Best Actor nomination? I think Beautiful was more recent than because I think you got nominated for it. I'm going to be really impressed if you come up with this. But I'm always impressed when you come up with this stuff, so. So the first movie he got nominated for. Yes. Right? Okay. Yep. He wasn't in 21 Grams. That's Benicio Del Toro. Oh, 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 oh. Dark, dark, dark places, darkness falls, darkness falls, dark falls? Dark. (laughs) I think you're on the right track. Uh, Do you know what the movie's about? No. I just remember seeing his name on lists. It's like dark. Something falls, right? Something yes. falls. Night falls. Before night falls. <laughs> From two thousand, it's a movie about the life of Cuban poet and novelist Ronaldo mm. Ronaldo Arenas. Okay. So um, that was Bardem's first English speaking role. Yeah. Um, I, I looked at some of the other actors. I is not a movie I heard. Two thousand. Okay, so Russell Crowe won for gladiator that year um but anyway so there's question number one i'll, 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 give, you a half point? <laughs> so I'll give you a half point because i think you were on the right right trail so it was the that's the movie i was thinking of i just couldn't get the title exactly right 
Okay. No Country for Old Men had eight nominations at the 80th Academy Awards. Name the only other film that year with eight nominations. There Will Be Blood. Do you know which two were the only ones that they won for? That There Will Be Blood one? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Best Actor, obviously, Daniel Day-Lewis, and then Best Cinematography. Okay, good. We said those. We wanted yeah, to see if yeah. you could, you know, wrap that That's up. Right. I would have guessed that anyways, because like, when I started the review, I talked about how I thought it won. Also, a quick note on that. They were, yeah, like you mentioned, they were tied for the most nominations that year. That's a low number. Usually, the most nominations is like 12. Yeah. For a movie. Yeah. I just thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay, question number three. We talked about this movie already a little bit, but Diablo Cody won Best Original Screenplay that year for Juno. Mm -hmm. Do you know the last woman to win that award before her? For her, ooh. Writing in general or like original? Original screenplay. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, Emma Thompson, because she won in 95, but that was adapted, because she won for Sense and Sensibility. One in 06. The Departed was adapted. Ooh, ooh, wait, I think I might know. Okay, you, you have a guess? Yep. All right. What do, you, what do you got? I don't know if this is original or not. But Sofia Coppola won for Lost in Translation. That's in right. Yes. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the tough one? Yeah. Yes. Yes. You are exactly correct. Sofia Coppola, last, Lost in Translation, 2003. Okay. So you are, uh, you got two and a half out of three. Good job. <laughs> Okay, now this last question, uh, no partial credit. Oh, okay. Okay. This is a... <laughs> this is a five-part question. Five part? No partial qu- qu- credit on a no, five-part question? No, I am testing you. Okay. Okay? Because I know we have talked about this before, so I know... I know that the information's there. I just gotta know if you can pull it out right now. Okay. At the 80th Academy Awards, Kate Blanchett became the sixth performer to be nominated for portraying the same character in two different films. As we already said, she, she was did, nominated. Did get nominated for him. To, yep. As we said, she was nominated for playing Queen Elizabeth uh, this year, 2007, for Elizabeth the Golden Age. She was also nominated for playing Queen Elizabeth in 1998 for the film Elizabeth. Very creative titles, right? Yeah. Okay. Like I said, she was the sixth actor nominated for portraying the same character in two different films. Name the other five. So, like, are we counting people where it happened after her, too? No. So Sylvester Stallone doesn't count? Oh, never mind. Okay. So, <laughs> All time. Okay. Sylvester All Stallone. Time. He's nominated twice for Rocky. One Rocky and then Creed. Yes. 39 years apart. You should have won. Too. 39 years apart well, for those two roles. We'll get into it when we get to that year, which might be a ways now. He should have won for Creed, but anyways. Bing Crosby uh, for Father O'Malley in Going My Way and then The Bells of St. Mary. <laughs> this is unbelievable. Yep, two for two. So there's three more? Uh-huh. Um... Oh, Jason R- Robards, Roburns, right? Him is. I do not have him on my list. Oh, okay. So we can get the fact checker out. No, no, no and see right. if I missed him. Um. So I need three more. Oh, duh, Paul Newman for. Uh, the Hustler and Color of Money. Do you remember his character's name? Um, no. Mm-hmm. I feel like I should. The Hustler is Okay, classic. okay, okay. I'll be nice. I'll his name's The Hustler. Fast Eddie Felsen. Fast Eddie Felsen, yep. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so you're correct. Against Paul Minnesota Newman. Fence. Hustler, Color of Money. Yep, okay, two more. I mean, one, I mean, 
not like I would ever be able to come up with any of these, except for Sylvester Stallone. I just I remember that one. Yeah. Um, but that was recent. One of these I think is pretty obvious. Oh shit! It doesn't count. So this might be a weird one that isn't on your list, but back. So we mentioned going my way. That mm-hmm. was the first and only year that the same actor got a nomination for Best Actor and Supporting Actor in the same year mm-hmm. for playing the same role. Oh, okay. Is that on your list? Um, oh, shit. What's what's his name? Like Fitzsimmons or... No, that's not on there. That was a weird thing. Like The Academy changed the rules after that so mm-hmm. someone couldn't get nominated. Um in the same year for the same role in two different categories. How does that even... I, I don't know how it happened. It was back in 1944. I, I yeah, They know. didn't know what they were doing yet. No. <laughs> Maybe they still don't. I don't know, but... True. Um, okay. I need to go through this. Okay. 90. I mean, do you want me to give you, like, decade? Yeah. Give me a little hint here. Okay. I keep thinking... Okay. Uh, one is from the 60s. The other is from the 70s. Mm. Mm. Let's see. So is this the same actor getting nominated for the same role or if two the different same, actors get nominated for the same role? The same actor okay. being nominated for the same role. Oh, God, I'm an idiot. Al Pacino. K- Yes. Well, it's funny because I've been thinking The Godfather, but because De Niro and Marlon Brando played the same character and they both won an Oscar, but they're, that's, I was hung up on The Godfather, but no, duh, Al Pacino yep. for playing Michael Corleone in Godfather yep. 1 and 2. Yep, yep. So yeah, it's one actor, one role. Yep, yeah, no, you're, you're right. I, just, I yep. was getting caught up yep. on that. Okay, so one more. And it could be like, um, like lead role or supporting yeah, role. Yeah, that, and that's what Al Pacino. That's what Al Pacino yeah. was. He was nominated for a supporting actor in Godfather One, and then lead in Two, and then vice versa for like Rocky with Stallone. Um, in the sixties. Huh? Classic. Classic, iconic actor. I'm so glad that I'm stumping you. But I know you know this, because I know what we've talked about before. Like I said, putting you on the spot. Both, both nominations were in the 60s? Yes. Classic actor. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm reveling in the fact that I have an answer to something that you don't. It's only because um, I've looked, looked it up. up. <laughs> It's not like I actually know it, but this is fun for me. Oh, in 64, um, My Fair Lady won, but I have nothing to do with that movie. I need to go to bed, so we need to, you need oh, to rack yeah. your brain well, a little bit faster. It's technically <laughs> Friday. Happy Friday. Um... Would you like me to give you the roll? Uh, if you give me the roll, I'm probably gonna get it. Give me a couple more minutes and then. Um, okay. No, I think I got it. This was throwing me off because this. Okay, no, I know what it is. This is throwing me off because these aren't sequels. This is, just, okay. this is just the same character. It is Peter O'Toole? It is Peter O'Toole. For Beckett and then Lion in the Winter? Yes. Yeah. So, For which uh, one? King, Can you tell? King Henry the Eighth? Six? Second. Second. King Henry the Second. Yeah, no, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that was throwing me off because I was trying to think of sequels and then I realized that 
I was trying to think maybe actress, and I was thinking Catherine Hepburn. I'm like, oh, Catherine Hepburn won the Oscar for Lion in the Winter in 68. Oh, wait, Lion in the... Peter... Yeah, th- it's the same role in two different movies, but they're not like sequels. They're not related. They're not related yeah. in any way. He's just playing the same character twice. Woo! That was impressive. I think it did okay. Yeah, that was pretty good. I mean, if anyone else can do better than that... Um, send us a message because that's impressive um kind of related to that question so i said kate kate blanche was like the sixth or like she is one, one of, of six, six. Yeah. now that yep yep you're right because sylvester Stallone was after that yep so she's one of six to be nominated for the same character in two different films she's also you kind of brought this up the 11th performer to receive multiple acting yeah, nominations in the, in the same year yeah so i know jamie fox did that in like oh four, you got nominated for Ray and one for Ray and got nominated for Collateral and Tom Cruise. Maybe they count that weird thing where the guy got nominated <laughs> in the same year for yeah. the same role twice. I, I did not look into that, so who knows? Um, there's I, a chance. I think there's a chance that might happen this year with Scarlett Johansson. Maybe she gets nominated for Marriage uh, Story and and JoJo, Jojo Rabbit. Rabbit. Who knows? Yeah, hmm. interesting. I think one other thing that I thought was kind of cool, I couldn't really think of how to turn this into a question, but one thing that I thought was cool, so like we mentioned, Joel and Ethan Coen, the Coen brothers, won Ooh. for Best Ooh. Director. Yeah. Yeah. They're only the second duo. They're to only the award. second duo because yeah, the Academy does not um, award Best Director to multiple people. Um, they only will allow it if it's like an established duo, which obviously... Hmm. The Cohen brothers are. So, uh, which which is the only other best director that went to two people? I mean, it was for the same movie. Like a, it was like a partner. Oh, a West, Side, West Side Story. Yep, yep yeah, West Side yeah, yeah, Story yeah. in 1961. Yep. So, yeah, they don't hand out nominations or awards for, um, for multiple directors unless it's established mm-hmm. duo. So, there you go. Those? I I have no other quiz questions. How 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 do I do? Do those stump you? Those are good. You think? If okay, you can come good. up with like that quality of questions every once in a while, that'd be good. I get... Every once in a while, okay, good. I'm glad yeah. you didn't say it like no, every, no, not so. every time. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, I guess before we close out this longer than usual episode, uh, we've reviewed five best picture winning movies so far. How would you rank them? Let's see. Let's pull up a list Let's so say, I can yeah, take me, a look at them. Let me... So the five that we've done, Chariots of Fire, Shakespeare in Love, Beautiful Mind, Platoon, and now No Country for Old Men. Okay. Uh, fifth, I would say Platoon. Fourth, I would say Chariots of Fire. Third, I would say Beautiful Mind. Two, I would say No Country for Old Men, and my favorite thus far has been Shakespeare in Love. I don't I've, even know if that matches the score that I gave them, but I'm just thinking like, that's that's how I would rank them right that's now. That's all right. I've got my scores up here. So coming in at number five with a score of 7.3 is Chariots of Fire. Uh, in fourth is, with a score of 7.7 is your number one, Shakespeare in Love. Boo. Save and Private Ryan should have won. Uh, coming in third is the one that we reviewed today with an 8.3. No Country for Old Men. Fourth, or no, second. I was going the wrong way there for a second. In second place is A Beautiful Mind with an 8.4. And then right now my number one is your number five. So we're really <laughs> aligning there. Uh, is Platoon with a nine. Yep. Sorry, I'm not a big war movie person. That's all right. And I am. So that's where we're at with our rankings. I think we'll maybe not bring update these every episode, but every couple episodes maybe we'll we'll uh, update our rankings, kind of say where what we're sitting at with those. Yeah. So yeah, I think that sounds good. Maybe in a few more episodes we'll we'll add in the next three or four or five something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, tune in next week. We will be reviewing the current Buzz film, which is Ford versus Ferrari. We will also be talking about the 1995 Best Picture winner, which was Braveheart. Please follow, rate, subscribe to the podcast. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Oscar Real Pod. For this week, Matt and Haley, 
saying go see a movie this week